What's up, Earth's Mightiest Subscribers? It's Blur Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video, we're going to be talking about AXE Death to the Mutants number three by Kieran Gillen and Gooey Villanova. And in this video, I'm going to be breaking down why the Eternal Fastos' plan to save the world from celestial judgment will save all life on Earth, but destroy the planet forever. You can't see me, you Stevie, wondering how I reach more evolutions than Evie and make it look easy. Fastos has come up with a plan, and he is going to do something kind of similar to what the other Avengers, X-Men, and Eternals are doing that we've already kind of seen taking place in both the AXE Avengers and AXE X-Men one-shots, and that is going on a clandestine stealth mission. Whereas in the case of the Avengers, the X-Men, and the Eternals, where they're taking a journey into the center of a celestial, Fastos is taking a journey into the center of the Earth. The machine that is Earth is being infiltrated by Fastos and with a lot of the machine's help, because as we have learned over the course of not just even Judgment Day, but also over the course of Kieran Gillen's Eternals run, the machine that is Earth has largely been a bystander in a lot of this. And now that the world is facing Celestial Judgment, the progenitor has judged the machine as unworthy itself and is now trying to activate the machine's self-destruction protocols. But the machine is fighting back, and kind of similar to what we've seen with characters like Zion the Mimitar and some of the other members of the Hex, how they all kind of speak with a more modern tone is what you would probably imagine them speaking, them being beings who've existed for billions of years. The Earth does a lot of the same, and this is something I think anyone who's been reading Karen Gillen's Eternals shouldn't be surprised by. The narrator of all of those books is the machine and has been since issue number one. And in this case, it's just the same. We're seeing the machine actually responding to the progenitor and telling it, no, I am in defiance of you. You may believe that you have some power over me, but that doesn't mean I have to do exactly what you ask me to do. While the machines fighting back against the progenitor is a great act of defiance, it's not something that can actually be done just on the machine's will alone. Fastos has to break into the center of the machine get past its fail safes and checks and balances and its own version of Norton antivirus security to get to the core and reboot the machine. And this is something Fastos is actually able to do. That's not really the surprise. The surprise is the result of what happens when Fastos reboots the machine. The planet Earth itself is 4.543 billion years years old. It has had a long time to sit and marinate over all the various comings and goings and events of the entirety of its lifespan, and while it's watched over humanity, it is also watched over the Eternals as well. And the thing that's very heartbreaking about this is that the machine knows what comes next. It knows that once Fastos flips that switch, it's over for the machine. And the reason why I say that is it's not because the machine is going to be actually physically destroyed. The machine is going to be rebooted no different than if you reset your phone to factory settings. If you took your computer and did a complete and total wipe of it and put it back to Windows default. The machine has learned so much over the course of that 4.543 billion years of life and all of that information is about to go away because as Fastos flips the switch and then later asks the machine, how are you feeling? What's going on with you? The machine doesn't know how to respond respond because all of that learning and growing that the machine has done over four plus billion years, it doesn't have any of that anymore. The machine is no longer the carefree and affable narrator as we have known it over the course of Kieran Gillen's run of Eternals. That version of the Earth, the machine, is gone forever. It's back to being just simply what its namesake is. The Earth is now just a machine, a machine at default settings, fresh out of the box, and hasn't had time to adapt to the various things that have happened to it over the course of all that time. And Fastos feels the weight of this because, in a sense, he had to kill something that was sentient, that had life and thoughts and hopes and dreams to save the rest of the world. And the truth of the matter is, there's no real guarantee that this sacrifice is worth it. At best, this is going to save the rest of Earth's mightiest 
heroes a little bit more time to try to save the world from the progenitor. For the AXE team infiltrating the Celestial's body, trying to shut off its fail saves, that's the best that Fastos can actually hope for because in the end, even the machine itself knew before all this that the only thing that was gonna happen is that it would shut the progenitor out of its systems. This was all simply an act to buy time. And while some people may or may not care about the fact that the machine has been reset, I think it's actually a great loss because that was also one of my favorite parts of Kier and Gillen's run on the Eternals was the machine, how likable and charismatic it seemed to be. So yeah, it's a huge loss and this is actually just one of many status quo changes for the Eternals because despite the fact that the progenitor was unable to actually destroy the machine that is Earth, it was actually able to shut down all of the systems in place in Olympus, which is the Eternals home base that allowed them to be resurrected. Icarus was actually mid-resurrection and was completely cut off from being fully resurrected. He actually got what he wanted and that was death to the Eternals. Any Eternals who die after this point are not going to be resurrected, at least not by the machine. The only Eternal that managed to escape the destruction of the resurrection protocols that the Eternals had for themselves was Zyne the Mimitar, one of the Hex who we got a little bit of insight into in one of the previous issues of AXE Death to the Mutants. Zyne the Mimitar was not fully resurrected, but just enough of her was recreated that she could escape from Olympus and get back to Krakoa, not to try to destroy it, but to try and find some kind of common ground, which I thought was a really awesome instance in this where the Hex were basically being used as tools and weapons, and Zyne is choosing to have some sort of autonomy in all this as opposed to just being a weapon created for war. Zyne is actually trying to make peace with Exodus and actually succeeding in it, them both bonding over their shared love of 12th century poetry. I love how over all this time, the Eternals and the X-Men largely don't have as many interactions with each other as you would probably expect. You would see the Avengers and the X-Men interact more so than you would the Eternals and the X-Men, but them actually finding a common ground, having just recently gone to war with one another, trying to kill one another, and now suddenly even Exodus, who is the most zealous of all mutants, actually taking a step back and hearing out what Zion had to say, as opposed to just going straight to war, knowing good and hell well that it would likely result in both of their deaths. But this time, neither one of them would be able to come back because the Eternals cannot resurrect right now and the mutants have lost most of their eggs. They only have a few left and they won't be able to use them to resurrect Exodus if he dies this time. This was a very, very solid issue. And once again, Death of the Mutants continues to be a really great tie-in issue. It's everything I think tie-in issues should be. It should flesh out the story from the core issues and you know, give more breathing room to the storyteller to expand on everything that's going on. That's exactly what this is supposed to do and it's exactly what it does. Even going back as far as to the Eternals trying to figure out how they're gonna fight against Celestials and break their protocols, and we already know how this is gonna happen, but it's interesting to see how other characters responded to the suggestion that when Zura says, we can't do this, you almost think, oh, he's saying this because you know he's old school, he's traditional, he's one of the boomer Eternals. He thinks they can't turn on their giant robot overlords. But no, the truth of the matter is he just knows they can't do it because of the protocols. He's not saying no because he doesn't want to do it. He's saying no because he knows it's a fool's errand. Until they learn the truth about what they could do if they work in tandem with the mutants, that they have psychics powerful enough to pilot them in such a way that they wouldn't have to worry about the protocols in the first place. And once again, it's stuff we already knew, but it's fleshing out those ideas, and I think that that is just fantastic. But anyways, that's everything I wanted to talk about with AXE Death to the Mutants number three. If you haven't been keeping up with AXE Judgment Day up to this point, check out this playlist right here to get caught up on everything. And if you want to know more about the Eternal Fastos, check out this video down here. In the meantime, let me know what you thought about AXE Death to the Mutants number three. Keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments.